What's up everybody, Max here coming to you from New York City. I am sitting here with the one and only Dr. Richard Isaacson, MD. He's a neurologist. He focuses on Alzheimer's prevention. He runs the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Weill Cornell Medical College, New York Presbyterian. And he just published his latest book called The Alzheimer's Prevention and Treatment Diet. I'm a huge fan of his work, uh, so I wanted to have him here for you guys to uh, ask him a few questions about his work. So, Dr. Isaacson, thank you for being here. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Yeah, tell me about the book. So why did you, why did you write this? So, too many people just don't realize that when it comes to brain health, you are what you eat. You've heard that, and most people think you, you can eat healthy, and you can help your heart, and you can help your this or your that. It's absolutely the same way about the brain. And what we wanted to do is we want to try to put together a summary of all the research that's been going on, decades of research, and then our experiences treating real patients, seeing real patients like you, like people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond, anyone that wants to reduce their risk using evidence-based, scientifically shown, and safe ways that anyone can do to improve their brain health. And we wanted to put this out there for the public in an easy to read fashion. Um, we also included a lot of cool free online tools, diet trackers and educational courses that you can watch online to kind of complement the book. Um, we wanted to help as absolutely many as people as possible. That's why we wrote the book. Why today? I mean, could this book have been written 10 years ago? Oh, I mean, 10 years ago, things were still, I would say still developing and still in its infancy. I think the field is still uh, definitely developing and we still have a long way to go, but I think I am certain that we can tell people that there is a brain healthy way to live and a brain healthy way to eat, uh, a brain healthy way to, you know, go to sleep, a brain healthy way to do, a brain healthier way to do everything. And when it comes to nutrition and diet, there's dietary patterns, there's single and multiple nutrients that a person can intake. And what we try to do is we try to make this digestible. And um, literally as, as, as recent, we were editing this book until literally a month ago, um, you know, putting the finishing touches, um, adding the latest research. Um, it's it's uh, hopefully easy to read and hopefully just a, an easy plan that really anyone can, can try to follow. Now, one thing that you've always been very adamant about since I've no since I met you uh, is the idea that there's no such thing as a one size fits all dietary approach. How did you reconcile that idea with, yeah. with the writing of the book? Uh, that was difficult, um, and I I took the words right out of my mouth. There, you know, Mr. Jones may need to eat you know one set of foods, and Mrs. Smith, well. No, no, they, she needs to eat completely uh, something a little different. So I mean, how do you reconcile this in a one-size-fits-all approach book? That, that's hard. And what we do in the book is we talk about, um, this is called precision medicine or precision nutrition. And uh, everybody has a different biology. Everyone has different genetics. You know, I've heard over and over again that my mom did everything right and she still got Alzheimer's. And I understand that, I completely get that. I have four family members with Alzheimer's disease. I know your, your family's been affected by dementia. I, listen, there's, the problem here is that each person needs something differently. And what we tried to do is we gave the best available evidence about what are the things that actually may be one size fits all approach. And then in terms of personalization, we talked about other ways that people can kind of get to know their own biology, get to know their own health, see their doctor, learn about themselves, talk to their doctor, and then personalize therapies for them specifically. Amazing. Now, I know that you personally uh, have been touched by Alzheimer's disease. Do you want to share a little bit of your story? Yes. Yeah, so um, I have four family members with Alzheimer's disease. My uncle Bob, uh, great uncle Bob, was diagnosed back when I was in high school. Um, he did a couple of things. He not only introduced my parents, so that's why I'm here today. Um, this is a completely true story. I'm still afraid of the water. Um, when I was three years old, I literally fell into the pool. Uh, my cousin Jeff ran inside to, to get help, and Uncle Bob was in the Navy, and he jumped in, and literally I... I you pulled me out of the water with you know me spitting water out. Wow! Um, and literally, I, I don't go near the water uh, till this day. Um, uh, it, it still freaks me out. Whether trauma, it's, you must be traumatized. Uh, uh, st still, actually, yeah. Water, water is terrible. So, anyway, my great uncle Bob was diagnosed. Uh, he was diagnosed when I was in high school, um, and um, I just saw. You know, I was. I, I was finishing medical school and his decline was, was terrible. I finished all of my training, um, you know, I'm ready to go, I'm gonna fight this disease after my Uncle Bob passed away. And at a, at a wedding, my dad's cousin is sitting next to me and she asked me the same question, no less than five times in, in literally two minutes. Um, and it just, it was like a flashback, it was all happening again. So, I mean, I've seen this from every angle. Um, I, I've seen this when I was three years old, you know, my great uncle Max, um, 
uh, my cousin, my uncle, great uncle Bob, another family member who lived in California who passed away recently. Um, I don't know, I've just seen this disease and, and it's all its ugly forms. And I felt that based on science, if we intervene early enough and if we translate the science that's out there now, I think we can make a real big impact. What's so interesting about your clinic is that you see patients from across the age spectrum. I mean, you have 20 year olds. 25. 25. 25. Yeah, 25. So you were my youngest actually for, <laughs> for quite a while. Um, uh, and then um, we went down to 29, 27, and now 25. We go from 25 to 91. It's never too early or too late uh, to think about or get educated about or intervene uh, when it comes to Alzheimer's prevention. Um, our average age in the clinic is 55, but we have a big, a big spread. Um, we see people from all walks of life, from all over the world. Um, about 40% of our uh, patients actually don't live in New York City. Uh, wow. They travel in um, every six months to get their cognitive uh, assessments and their laboratories and their body measurements and their body fat. And um, So we see people of all ages and, and, and all risk uh, profiles, and we follow people over time and we intervene, and it's never too early or too late. I, I really believe that. Yeah, and it's important to underscore that this is a field that's rapidly evolving. I mean, we've made tremendous yeah. strides, scientists, you know, practitioners have made tremendous strides in the past decade, but it's still, I mean, it seems like every week there's a new study coming out elucidating the ways yeah. that our diets and our lifestyles interact with our genes for, you know, different brain health outcomes. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. We started this clinic three years ago, okay, it was just me. I uh, came from Miami, I missed miss the palm trees, but I'm a Yankees fan, so recruited to New York, start this clinic, we're now 33 people, wow. okay, in, in just under three years. And I would say that in three years, 30 to 40 percent of the recommendations that I give today I didn't know about three years ago. Wow. I mean, what other field in medicine has that type of development and growth and exponential progress? Um, I, I, you know, Alzheimer's is horrible. It's a terrible disease. But I have more hope now than ever because literally every week, you know, two weeks ago a big study came out. I'm now reading this study and then translating it into practice. The problem with medicine is that textbooks are textbooks. We've got a lot of textbooks here from decades ago. And you know, based on an Institutes of Medicine report, it takes 10, 15, up to 20 years for things to be proven in science today to be translated into routine medical practice. Alzheimer's disease, we, we don't have 10 or 15 or 20 years to wait. If something's proven yesterday, I'm gonna implement it tomorrow. And that's really what we do in the clinic. We take all these advances, we take the latest in genetics, we take the latest in food and nutrients and levels and inflammation and metabolism and insulin and body fat. We take all the things we're learning about today and apply them in the clinic in a personalized way, clinical precision medicine tomorrow. It's so interesting. And you know, the speed at which things are evolving, as you, as you touched on, perfectly illustrates why there can, even within the medical establishment sometimes be a sort of skepticism around oh, yeah. the notion of whether or not we can really affect our brain health. Would you uh, say that's true? I would agree with that wholeheartedly. The first time I ever gave a lecture on Alzheimer's prevention was back in 2007. And I, the, the, I, the, the stares that I got and the tomatoes that the audience people wanted to throw at me, um, I, I mean, just the concept, it was, it, was, it was derogatory in a way. You know, the time to use Alzheimer's and prevention in the same sentence is now. No, we can't definitively 100% you know, prevent someone from getting Alzheimer's, no. But, but one out of three cases is preventable based on modifiable risk factors, and it may be preventable if that person takes the right steps. And in the two out of three cases that aren't preventable, there are still things people can do. You can't be afraid, you, you can't be in denial, you have to get the latest knowledge, read a book, go on a website, talk to your doctor, most, most importantly, and put together a plan that's right for you. Um, if you can delay Alzheimer's by six months, a year, two years, by doing all the right things, and in that six month, one year, or two year duration, that blockbuster drug comes, well then you've effectively prevented your Alzheimer's. And people don't get that. People say there's nothing you can do, and I, oh yeah, there's nothing, no, no, you, my, my per, you know, she did everything right. It's much more complicated than that. The problem is that some people can do everything right, and some people can have a specific gene, an early onset gene. Only 6% of Alzheimer's cases have the early onset gene. If they have that gene, they're gonna get Alzheimer's disease. But genes are not our destiny. I mean, you, we've talked about this so many times. You can win the tug of war against your genes, and if you have a gene, you can do very specific things to fight that gene. And uh, I think people are just, uh, Denial. I think denial's denial's key. I think people just aren't informed. 
Um, you know, it, it, you, you could write a book and, and you could put a website together and you could put information out there, but if someone's not even going to read the information or, or right. access the website, you know, what good is it? Um, I think the concept of Alzheimer's prevention will be accepted a couple more years, whether it's three years or five years. There's Alzheimer's prevention research trials ongoing right now, whether it's late onset, early onset Alzheimer's, there's clinical trials you can join. If you don't want to join a trial, there's 101 things you can do to reduce your risk. Hmm. And, you know, we were actually, we were on the Dr. Oz show together recently. And one thing that I remember you saying, uh, which really stood out to me is, you know, you can't just take a blueberry and expect to, yeah. you know, to be fighting off such a complex and uh, an insidious disease. Yeah. You know, you, you made the analogy of there being, uh, or, you know, there being multiple roads that any one person can take to yeah. get to the disease. Men will take different roads than women, for yeah. example. And so you really, you know, especially if it's in your, if you have a risk factor, you really kind of have to go to war with yeah. the disease. Absolutely, yeah. And, and the concept of, of a person taking different roads to Alzheimer's, unfortunately, that's just not in the rubric. People just don't understand, doctors don't understand that. Um, the, the public just doesn't understand that. And you have to identify which road you may be on, and then we have to get you to take a detour. Um, you know, and like you said, just eating one blueberry, there's not a magic blueberry out there that's going to prevent or cure Alzheimer's disease. And I, I can tell you, though, that a half a cup of blueberries two to three times a week is probably enough to reduce your risk at least by a little bit in most people. You know, that may be one of those one-size-fits-all uh, definitions. The, the key here, though, is well, should they be organic blueberries or do they not need to be organic? Well, that's when we get into precision medicine. And so as an example, you can eat a lot of blueberries, but if you have one gene and you're eating blueberries with pesticides, then that's actually harmful for you if you have that gene. If you don't have that gene, pesticides are probably less harmful. So the key here is that not only is it personalized, it's complicated. And I think over the next few years, few years, give it a few years, I don't think we need another decade. I think in the next few years, the concept of personalized nutrition and clinical precision medicine and Alzheimer's prevention and treatment will not only evolve, but hopefully will become much more um, kind of on the on the, the normal, uh, the, the gold standard, the industry standard um, when it comes to, the, to this disease. Incredible. You guys, Dr. Richard Isaacson has a new book out called The Alzheimer's Prevention and Treatment Diet. It's an incredible book. I've read it. I've got an endorsement right in there on the third page. I'm super excited for that. And Dr. Isaacson is also going to be featured in my documentary uh, coming up called Breadhead, which you can check out um, updates on by joining our mailing list at breadheadmovie.com. Super excited for that. We're just about to wrap up, but uh, Dr. Isaacson, can you share with me your three favorite foods to boost one's brain health? Oh boy, this is tough. Um, let's start with the good fats. So there's good fats, there's bad fats, and then there's fats that maybe science needs to, to learn a little bit more about. Uh, the most brain healthy fat out there, if I had to pick one, are going to be the omega-3 fatty acids. And it's not all omega-3s, they're not all created equal, but the two that are my favorite based on the, the evidence is DHA and EPA. And DHA may be a little bit more so, and EPA a little less so. Um, Fatty fish, several, at least once or twice a week, lake trout, mackerel, herring, albacore tuna, sardines, wild salmon. These are things that should be a staple of a person's diet. You know, whether a person should take a supplement or not, that's confusing. It may depend on the person's levels. It depends on a whole variety of things. Uh, nutrients are always best to get in the food, the whole food, and otherwise some people need supplements and you know, I recommend them uh, frequently, but it depends on the genetics, it depends on blood levels, it's complicated. Next, uh, well, we talked about blueberries. I'll say in general, antioxidants. Antioxidants are key. Um, you've taught me about a lot about inflammation, actually, and the searing in the brain. Um, whatever reason, maybe it's calming inflammation, whatever, whether it's neuroprotection, um, antioxidants are key. So not just blueberries and strawberries um, on a regular basis, half a cup several times a week. Um, the antioxidants in dark cocoa powder. Um, I really believe, you know, every morning uh, in my coffee, I actually have um, dark cocoa powder. Um, uh, it's basically a, a half a packet or a full packet. I mix it up. Uh, it's, it's a little bitter, but it's, it's good for the brain. It actually can help with insulin resistance. I know a topic you're, you're passionate about. Um, actually helps with blood pressure control. It helps with memory function, potentially. Um, it's, it's just a pretty good staple, and I think it's good for the heart and the mind, too. Um, and then I'll grab this in front of me. This is my green juice for the day. Um, this is um, a, an easy way to, you know, uh, you know uh, 
cut down uh, the absolute amount of uh, intake you have. And, and basically, you know, I, I eat roughly two meals a day instead of three. Um, I believe in overnight fasting. So maybe I'll combine the third uh, big brain tip with um, with fasting. So overnight fasting or, or fasting two days a week, only eating within, say, an eight to ten hour time period, um, giving your your your, uh, your pancreas and your body to kind of cool, cool down a little bit. Um, you know, you finish eating at uh, 5 p.m., you don't eat the next morning till you know seven, eight, nine p.m. That's, that's 14, 16 hours. Or, uh, sorry, so sixteen hours overnight. Um, and then um, one way to also cut down the amount of meals is to have two two full meals, you know, hearty meals, um, and then have a, a green juice, which uh, which will uh, keep you keep you, the fiber will keep you full. The nutrients will protect your brain, um, and it's also one way to restrict overall caloric intake because uh, even less calories uh, has actually been shown to decrease uh, Alzheimer's risk as well. I like that. Also feeds the microbiota that live in the large intestine. All right, so you met, you've mentioned wild fish, you've mentioned blueberries, dark chocolate, um, and uh, we've got a, we've got a, we've got fasting, and we've got your bonus green juice. What's one thing that everybody everybody should do every single day to benefit their brain? So you have to make your brain and belly happy. I get that. Um, you got to enjoy what you do and what you eat and all that kind of stuff. The best thing that a person can, well, probably exercise is the best thing, but I, but if I, so let's say exercise on a regular basis is key and mixing up not just cardio, but also weight, weight training. You got to build muscle mass to keep the body fat down, keep metabolism up. But I would say in everything that you do, in everything, every activity you participate, every food that you eat, every exercise you do, just pause for a second and say, how can I make this effort just a little bit more brain healthy um, and I think that's key you know when, with exercise if you want to burn more body fat maybe interval training might be the way to do it do you don't you know, not know what interval training is well read about it learn about it talk to a personal trainer talk to your doctor um, inter- learn learn about it when, when we're talking about the, the green juices well I like green juice but how can I make my green juice brain healthier we've got to make be careful you don't want to filter out and get rid of all the fiber because then you're just it's just pure sugar it's going to spike your insulin keep the fiber in there if you don't understand how fiber works with digestion just learn about it google it or, or read a book or, or, do, or do something um, everything that a person can do can be made just a little bit more brain healthy and that incremental benefits over time it's not going to be one change one blueberry one green juice it's the incremental changes over time whether it's five years ten years or decades uh, that can really produce uh, a positive effects it's not all about living longer it's about living better and uh, what better way to do that than to protect your brain health beautiful knowledge is power people remember that Pick up Dr. Richard Isaacson's new book. I'm going to post a link in the caption of this video. Check him out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Alzheimer's disease. And check out his website at alzu.org, which has all kinds of amazing tools, uh, quizzes, lessons, recommendations, things that you could really sink your teeth into for a better brain. It's amazing. Can't recommend it highly enough. So uh, thank you, Dr. Isaacson, for talking with me. Thank you, Max, for spreading the word. Of course. Appreciate it. Cheers.